Hey guys, thanks for checking out another episode of the Helix Experience. I am here with my co-host and fiance, Steph Gordon. Welcome, Steph. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. So today we're going to be talking about all things uh, women, weightlifting, uh, diets, diet culture, all these touchy kind of topics, um, which are commonly talked about in the fitness industry. So yeah, Steph had a question for me this morning. I'll let her riff that out. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because obviously being female um, and being someone who's succumbed to diet culture in the past as well, I feel like there is a lot of, it gets a lot of negative press. I feel like women and diet and fitness get so much way worse press than men, right? Yeah, 100%. So um, tell me about like, because I think one of the biggest myths and the biggest things that I hear is about women lifting weights, right? Mm. And like, you know, girls are scared to lift weights. They don't want to get like hashtag bulky. They want to get too big. Like, so, you know, coming into Helix, like it was a, for me, you know, even being your partner and uh, at, the, at the time, your girlfriend, it was scary. Like I was like, well, you know, <laughs> am I going to get really jacked? Like, you know, like, can I lift weights with the boys? You know, it's like all those things. If you think if you go to like any of those 24 seven fitness places, like the girls and the guys, like typically the girls are on the cardio machines and the mm. dudes doing the weight sections. So like what's your thoughts on like women versus men and weight training? Yeah, uh, it was a, it's a common misconception, especially uh, at my gym. It's quite opposite where um, the men and the women, they lift the same. So we have a program for um, building lean muscle, getting strong, um, losing body fat, and then we have a program for barbell performance. So gender-specific differences between training programs doesn't exist in my gym because I don't believe in it. I think men and women should train the same because it's more dependent on the goal of the individual rather than a biological difference between males and females. So- in saying that, the program is the same for males and females, to be yeah. clear for anyone listening. However, the, obviously, they do different weights, yeah. you know. So, like, obviously, like, most of the girls aren't lifting what the guys – some of the girls are, but yeah. most of the girls aren't lifting what the guys are lifting. Yeah. Some of the women definitely do outlift the guys, which is great. But, yeah, that's the – I guess the major biological difference is I find that men and women can lift similar amounts lower body um, if there is like a, you know, if someone's training ages one year or male and female and they both train the same and they're on the same program and they have the same push coaches, all variables are the same. I feel like males and females can have similar results on the lower body, but on the upper body, it's where it's the mad difference between mm. males and females. Women just don't have the same potential for strength and size in the upper body that men do. I have a question around that. It's totally off topic and not all we plan to talk about today. Yeah. But uh <laughs> I was actually looking into this because I, like a little while ago, I was really interested in, you know, just like if you look at like even just like the movement of like a push press or a military press in our gym, yep. the dudes are just doing so much more weight than the girls, right? And yep. like we're like really pushing ourselves, but yep. like with the barbell. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like so hard. And I, so I looked into it and I read something about this and I don't know if this is true. You are definitely going to know. We've never discussed this before. Yeah. But it, like from a young age, guys like start doing push ups and like, you know, it, it's in their teens, it's in their early development because it's this like get it bro culture and that guy culture. And so, you know, boys are naturally starting to, I guess, develop those muscles mm. a little bit younger in life. Whereas, like, you very rarely go to school as a girl and they're like, yeah, let's do like a push up ladder or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, any of those. Is that true? 100%. Yeah. It's a, it's a cultural thing as well. But it's in, in terms of like strength potential, the ability for you to have a strength potential is relying on how much muscle mass you have. So, you know, there are no exceptions to that rule. The more muscle that a male or female has, the more potential for strength. And we've seen that in the gym countless times. So uh, we've had, you know, nearly 2,800 clients in the gym. And I'd say the ones that lift the most weights generally have a predisposition for having the most muscle. Mm, okay. Yeah. So back to the original topic of, women and men in the gym. Yeah. We do the same program. We being the women, yeah. I am the voice of the women today. Yeah. We do the same program as you guys and yeah. it's no different. There's no bulky chicks in our gym yeah. either. Why do you think this is such a common misconception? Why, do, why are girls scared of getting like, why do you think girls are scared of getting bulky? Um, or like, can, can you dispel the myth that it's actually going to happen? Cause it's like so unlikely. Yeah, it's a couple of factors to the myth. I think a big, big, big misconception of this is 
not social media, but media in general. Um, there was a there was a time I'd say probably like in the early two thousands, mid two thousands, maybe even the nineties, where like bodybuilder chicks, you know, girls that were on all sorts of performance enhancing drugs were shown on the media as like, this is what happens when you lift weights. And then during that uneducated period, there was this big movement around that. We're like, yeah, look, if, if you lift weights and you do anything other than running on a treadmill, doing spin classes and body pump and these types Pilates. of things, yeah, Pilates, you're going to look like an absolute unit. And that is just so far from the truth. For one, because women have around 10% of the sex hormones that men do in regard to producing uh, muscle mass and tissue. So we're talking about testosterone and growth hormone. Women actually have 10% of the that that men do. And a huge reason why men build muscle at a faster rate and larger rate than women is because of that. Mm. Mm. So... Yeah, because I remember, I remember like even on the front of like, you know, all the like women's fitness mags and all those sorts of things back in the day, it was, it was just the bodybuilders. Yeah. And, you know, from what I've seen, like I've got heaps of female friends who do bodybuilding and their bodies are just phenomenal. Like mm. they're not jacked. They're not like, I mean, they're like, obviously they're in shape, you know, but they're, they're kind of in shape that you would look at a chick on a beach and be like, whew, sis got a great rig, yeah. you know, they're not in shape like quadzilla like mm. they're not like jacked all through their back and like ripping out of their tank tops or any of that stuff it just it still looks super feminine and yeah. i just think that there's a really you're right big belief system since that culture of the 90s uh, sorry of the 2000s where we started to see that yeah i think another hypothetical example if we have like a woman that's 25 percent body fat and she adds 10 kilos of muscle and doesn't lose any fat she's still 25 percent body fat but she's got the 10 kilos of muscle underneath that quote unquote could look bulky to someone. Mm. Like it just depends on the person and what they're into and their preferences to it. Like I fully understand that that may be not everyone's personal preference, but you know, my personal preference would be, I think it would look better. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. So on that topic of the fact that, you know, you can put on size, like if you come to somewhere like Helix and it's a strength and conditioning gym, which yeah. means that we do strength. So we're going to gain some muscle, right? Yeah. Um, and and you don't lose that body fat and and maybe you build that muscle. I think, I, I, look, I don't know. I'm going to throw this back to you. Yeah. But like typically you build muscle and then lose fat, right? Is that is that typically how it would be, I guess, prescribed if it was a best case practice? So a lot of my mentors in the diet and training space, they would recommend that a male gets to 8 to 12% body fat to be in his or his most anabolic state, meaning that when you are at that level, your body is most anabolic and has the uh, the right environment, so to speak, to build muscle and look better and all these types of things. And then women, it's 18 to 22%. Okay. So those are like the general like rule of thumb. This is what you want to go for, for men and women to start with. But yeah, like, yeah, in, in, to answer your first question, yes. So if you were to lose fat. Yeah which takes us on to our next topic of calories, calories, right? Yeah. Because I do, I like, I, this is a topic that really resonates and feels so real for me because yeah. I've never really been scared of lifting big weights. I've always kind of like, I mean, I don't lift that huge weights in the gym, but I've never really been scared of going into the gym and lifting huge weights because, you know, I just think that's super powerful and I love being a strong, you know, independent woman. Yeah, you don't need no man. Don't need no man, but <laughs> except you, but what I, have had a problem with and a huge problem with in the past with, you know, really bad body dysmorphia and, and some really kind of minor eating disorders has been, um, you know, calorie counting. Yeah. And I think that it's demonized in our society at the moment. Yeah. So do you think that tracking calories um, is the only way to lose weight? Do you, or do you think that it makes you fat? Do you think like, what is your, what are your thoughts around tracking calories and, and the stigma that it has in society? Yeah. So I come at it from a lens. I've been a coach for 12 years, coach thousands of people. The people that get better results track calories because it is a, a conscious thing. So if you're using an app called like Chronometer or My Fitness Power, one of the two, and you have like the daily habit of entering everything you're eating and consuming, including liquids and sources and foods into it, you're going to be consciously aware of, of what you're consuming. A lot of the time it goes wrong 
where people don't understand what they're actually consuming and what the caloric value of it is. So for you to lose weight, you need to be in a calorie deficit. There's no other way of spinning that in any way, shape or form, no matter what anyone tells you. If you do a, a carnivore diet and you do a keto diet and you do an Atkins diet and you do a juice diet and you do a cleanse and whatever it is, the method or the mechanism behind you losing weight will be a calorie deficit. So for people to get in a calorie deficit, the easiest way to do it is track what they're consuming. That mm -hmm. is the best way. Do you need it? No, you don't need it, but you've got to be an absolute wizard with the way you're feeling and thinking and intuition and, and understanding around food to get a result without it. So anyone that starts at our gym, I strongly recommend that they should be tracking their food consumption just to gain conscious competence on the foods. No, it doesn't have to be a forever thing. Like you don't need to track calories until, you know, the day you die, but you need to track calories until you know what a calorie is and how much everything's worth. Yeah, totally. I've been tracking calories now for about like, I mean, on and off for years, but consistently for the last kind of five weeks. And now I know how much I can eat of that thing because yeah. I've tracked it every day for five weeks, you know? Yeah. So now I'm like, oh, cool. I know I can have these two pieces of toast with this much honey and it's going to be this many calories. And so it's so much easier then to fit that into your lifestyle to make sure that you're, if you do have a goal, and this is it guys, like if you have a goal of losing weight, you have to get in a calorie deficit. Yeah. If you're not trying to lose weight, then you don't need to be, maybe you don't need to be in a calorie deficit. But yeah. if you are not happy with the way your body looks, if you are in that high, um, you know, ratio of a body fat percentage and it's not feeling good on your body, you're not feeling comfortable in your skin, all of those things, it's not about more self-love. Like mm. it's not about more like acceptance of your body is the way it is. If you want to be healthy, lower the visceral fat around your organs, if you want to, you know, lower your body fat percentage so that you can have a longer more healthy lifestyle and mm. longevity and live to, you know, an old age and be fit and dancing on tables at 90, then you need to start, you need to get into a calorie deficit, right? Yeah. hundred percent to get something you've never had. You're going to have to do something that you've never done, which is an incredible quote. Every time I sit in a consultation with someone and they ask me, what's it going to take for me to lose five kilos? I always say to them, you're going to have to do something you've never done. And what you've never done is track what your food consumption is. And they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't really want to do it. I can't do it. I find every excuse under the sun. But if you've got time to check your Instagram, which if you're probably listening to this, you've probably seen me advertise this podcast on Instagram, then you've got time to track your calories. It's just an excuse on not what not to do and not to do. So uh, someone I look up to in the field of um, diet, nutrition, training, his name's Menno Henselman. Okay, what a handful. You can check him out online. But something that Steph and I both see, which is perpetuated by social media, is that tracking calories is not good for my mental health. Tracking calories... Um, you know, makes me obsessive compulsive, tracking calories, um, ruins my relationship with food. And before I get into the, you know, a recent meta study, which uh, Menno Henselman published, I just want to get Steph's input on this because she sees it more than I do. I don't really follow anyone on social media that would perpetuate this kind of thinking. So uh, Steph definitely would, but you know, if, it was, if I was seeing people post this stuff, I probably would unfollow them anyway. I do think that, especially for women, and because I have a, a widely female audience, I see it so much that, yeah, there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of blame on the fitness industry for creating these habits. So like, you know, counting calories makes me obsessive compulsive. Getting on the scales makes me feel obsessive compulsive. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, you need to heal your relationship with food, uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And ever since I've been counting calories, you know, I've had people slide into my, into my DMs being like, you don't need to, like you're beautiful as you are. And just all of this kind of like, I guess, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And I love that people are coming to me with that, but like, I know what I want for my, for my body. I know that I need to drop body fat percentage to be, you know, to, to live the longest life that I can live, to lower the visceral fat around my organs, to be optimal in my energy levels and my sleep and my performance as a business owner, my, you know, the, the, hormones that are created in my body, like all of those things require me to drop a couple of kilos of, of weight. Right. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, 
I don't care what society is pushing right now, but I used to have a really bad relationship and I used to say the same things. I used to be like, I can't, I think when we first met, I was like, I don't want to weigh myself. I can't get, yeah. like, and what I, I don't get obsessed. I don't want to get obsessed. Like I can't because, you know, then I'll become obsessed with it and then I'll be, uh, you know, I'll go into this like self hate spiral girlfriend. If you are listening to this right now and you are feeling like that is you, or you are using that, um, current belief system i'm here to tell you you don't need to heal your relationship with food you need to heal your relationship with yourself because the minute that i started actually working on my own relationship um, and my own worthiness and my own self-respect and my own body image and loving myself exactly the way that i'm like i think that you know i don't i don't need to change my body aesthetically to be beautiful mm. the only reason i'm changing my body is because for long term health results and optimal performance yeah. right and so it's not that i'm trying to change it out of this you know deep hate and deep neglect like actually now the way i'm choosing to honor my body is to give it the nutrients and what it needs to be able to perform at its best and it's actually a practice of self-love and ever since i have switched that view which took years by the way ever since i switched that view now counting calories seems simple now getting on the scales is fine and i even have um you know, some people in my corner that are helping me with tracking and things like that. And they're like, you know, I know this might feel really uncomfortable. And I'm like, it doesn't feel uncomfortable. No. I don't care about getting on the scales every day. I don't care about tracking my calories because I don't care if the weight goes up and fluctuates back down during my period. I just don't care yeah. because my worth is not associated to the numbers that are coming up. Yeah. And so the minute that you work on your own worthiness, rather than like, you know, needing that external validation from others and truly loving on yourself and truly loving on where you are in your journey and relinquishing that need to, you know, be a certain way out of a self-hate space and actually focusing on it from a place of ultimate self-love. It's not relationship with food or the fitness industry that you need to heal. It's a relationship with yourself. Yeah. hundred percent. And if your goal is weight loss and you're scared of stepping on the scales, there might be just an issue there with being scared of the truth, because if you are hoping to lose weight and you're stepping on the scales and they're not going in the right direction. It's not that you're a failure. It's not that you're shit. It's not that you can never do it. It's not that you're going to be fat forever or whatever you think about yourself. It's, it's just your current plan is not working. And what you think the plan should be is not an accurate plan for you. And maybe you need to speak to a coach. Maybe you need to speak to a dietitian or a nutritionist or someone that just knows a little bit more or just someone that can support you. But it's just an indication of your relationship with gravity. That's just what weight is. It's mm. just a, literally an indication of it doesn't mean anything about you as a person. It doesn't mean that you're not a bad, you're not a good person or a bad person or anything like that. It's simply you just your relationship with gravity. And the reason I love tracking weights is because the average weight loss over a week, if you tracked every day, would be a better indication of your results going forward. So I like to do weekly averages with clients because it just shows a good trend um, in the way they're going down. And yes, especially with women like, you know, menstruation and periods and these types of things do result or can result in women gaining weight throughout that period. But that just needs to be a conscious thought is like, yeah, cool. I got my period. Uh, I'm not going to be super strict on my weight, but I'm not going to not track it because I fucking hate the number that I see on on the scale. It's just a, yep, cool. I understand that this is a moment. And then after my period's over, things are going to normalize again. So just before we get on to the next topic, and I just want to wrap that one up. So Menno Hensman actually posted this um, study where it was a meta-analysis that looked at uh, psychological, negative psychological effects and tracking calorie consumption and found there was no link between the two. And he did point to the fact that there may be some issues that were prevalent before people started tracking, which were the actual problem and not the culprit um, to it. So tracking your body weight and calories is not the issue. It's your issue with yourself that's the issue yeah and like mic drop because you know one of the things that we love is like the way you do anything is the way you do everything yeah. and so like i could liken this to business so easily it's mm. like you know if you are too scared to look at the numbers <laughs> on in, in your business for the fear of feeling like a failure, then you're probably too scared to get on the scales and see the numbers for the fear of failure. You're associating all of your worth and success to the result versus just knowing that you are successful and worthy and that it is just a practice of trial and error. Everything, whether it's business, whether it's fitness, whether it's relationships, whether it's anything like it's just all trial and error until you figure it out, you know, and, and 
yeah, Meadow's 100% right. Like your your relationship to those numbers is yours alone and they're not actually attributed to the numbers, but instead to the relationship you have with yourself. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to tackle the last uh, topic here. We've got written down um, why women should eat more to lose weight. And it's a bit of a counterintuitive statement or a bit of a mic drop moment because as soon as you hear that, you're like, fuck no, that doesn't work. But uh, the mechanism behind it is the higher that we can boost your maintenance calories and not gain weight, the more or the higher position we do have to diet from. So let's hypothetically say that Steph, my amazing fiance here, uh, gets her maintenance calories up to 2000 calories. And at that point, she's steady. She's not gaining body fat. Um, she's not gaining weight. She's not you know, showing any adverse signs of that. And then we can diet her down and drop her calories week to week. The higher you start, the easier it is because the less food you eat, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. So if we get her baseline up to a, a higher number that the dieting becomes easier, the higher you go, the easier it is for her psychologically, you know, mentally, physically, you know, her training is going to be better, all these types of things. But if you're looking to diet from a 1200 calorie maintenance, you're going to be shit out of luck pretty soon because you're going to get into a territory where you're having 800 calories a day. And that's not very healthy. It's not healthy. And like your body holds on to everything it gets in that way, you know? And then like, if you eat more than that, it's also holding on because now it's in the, is that, is that the truth? It's now yeah. in the mechanism of like holding on because yeah. it's constantly starving. Yeah. It's the fight or flight, like the mechanism of that. So yeah. yeah, I love that. And I think, well, I mean, obviously you've seen me struggle with it. Um, you know, I came from F45 when we first met and yeah. we were doing the, uh, the old 800 to 1200 calorie zucchini fucking diet. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I was skinny, but I was grumpy. I was tired. I was moody. And the minute that that 12 week challenge or whatever it was ended within three months, I'd gained it all back on. Yeah. And so, you know, it just wasn't long-term sustainable for me since then. Um, we're now uh, on the uh, mission of getting my maintenance up at the mm. moment. So uh, I've, started at 1800 calories which at first i was like oh my um, god it's too many yeah, the I'm, world is gonna end i'm gonna get fat <laughs> yeah. and uh actually yeah i started kind of losing weight sitting at 1800 for over a couple of weeks and then we've increased it to 1885 and now we're increasing it again to 1950 and and at some point i will start gaining mm. and then that's what that's what we'll know okay cool that's that's now we found maintenance yeah right true maintenance true maintenance we have found what true maintenance is yeah. and then we will drop because then the weight will just shift yeah definitely will i just want to touch on reverse dieting here so this is it's a trend it's always been a trend in the fitness industry is these bodybuilding competitions so what ten generally happens in figure, especially with the women's ones, is you know women will end up eating not much, um, and then they'll diet down. And let's just say the couple of weeks before comp, they're having a thousand calories or some eight hundred, you know, nine hundred calories. As soon as your body gets used to that level, and then you start adding in calories dramatically post competition, you gain weight very fast. So it's really common in bodybuilding competitions where you'll see someone on stage and then a week later, they look like a completely different person because they've just gained so much weight because they've been in a calorie deficit for so long that their body, the new norm of their maintenance calories is a thousand calories. And then as soon as they're after comp, you know, they go to McDonald's, they have a burger, they, you know, whatever they're going to do. And they're having two, three, 4,000 a day. Their body is just storing that as fat because it has been in this, you know, fight or flight mode for so long that, you know, I don't know when I'm going to get starved again. So I'm just going to store this as fat because, you know, biologically or physiologically, it is the most efficient fuel source that my body can use in times of need, which is also the dark side of, of these types of sports and, and these types of events is, yeah, people look good for one day and then they're suffering the consequences with their health, their physical appearance, and then just the ability to know that them to get back to that physical condition is probably going to take years or, or a lot of months to get back to it. So I'm more of the approach of, hey, let's gradually get you looking fucking incredible year round where we don't have to go to an extreme level of dieting and you know dehydration and all these types of things and fuck our metabolism fuck the hormones you know, hormones the menstruation all these types of things for like what a, what like an hour in the limelight taking some photos and then you're completely wrecked 
Yeah. And I also just want to like, I obviously totally agree with that. And I also want to touch on the calorie counting again, just really something came to mind just before. And it was like, you know, people think it's restrictive and I just really want to touch on the fact of this because since I've been counting calories, one, my maintenance has gone up. Woohoo. So the opposite of restrictive Mm. Two, um, we've been out for dinners. Yep. Plenty. Plenty. We've Way too many. Probably more than we should. But because I'm because I plan for that, cool. We're going every Friday night, Tim go out for dinner. Tim and I go out for dinner. So I know that on Fridays I have to eat less during the day so I can eat more at night. Totally fine. Um I we went we've been to the movies. I've eaten popcorn. Yep. We've had chocolate. Yep. The other day I had uh, ice cream. Um, it's not restrictive at all. I just have to be like everything else in my life organized. Yeah. Because if I plan my week and I know on Saturday I'm going to have an ice cream or like I feel like having an ice cream, like I can I can have it all. It's just kind of the same as and I love the like the connection between fitness and business because I just am like you can have it all, but you just can't have it all at once, right? Yeah. Like you're not going to have you're not going to start your business and have all the time freedom, all the financial freedom, um, and this you know beautiful business in the first six months. Yeah. Like it's just not possible. But you will have it eventually. You will have you know, all of those different aspects at different times. Um, but yeah, I just want to talk about the fact that it's like, it's actually the opposite of restrictive. And when you are, when you work with somebody like, you know, you, mm. you, and you find someone who's not into that crash dieting, restrictive dieting, all of that. Like, I really believe that you can have your cake and eat it too. I really believe that you can, you know, lose weight, um, you know, find your beautiful maintenance, like eat more and, you know, find those those beautiful balances without it needing to be restrictive or, you know, cutting any kind of food group out. Yeah. First thing you need to do is just take control of your current situation. You need to get a gauge of where you're at. You need to know how much you're eating, what your weight is, what your body fat percentage. You need to look at those numbers. And if they mean anything to you, that's great. If they don't, that's great too. But you need to be accountable to yourself and your numbers and what you're consuming. If you want to have any success with this long term because one thing that every mentor i've ever worked with has ever told me is the numbers do not lie yeah yeah and if you're not tracking like we all you know our brains always want us to be right yeah so if you're telling yourself you're healthy then you're gonna very very quickly delete the popcorn or the chocolate or the ice cream that you ate or the quick little like biscuit that you ate at lunch at the you know water cooler with a cup of tea the sugar that you added to your coffee that morning like it's going to be very easy to to forget that and only remember yeah but i had vegetables for lunch yeah because your brain always wants to tell you right so it's like how can we change the story how can we open up to see that maybe this isn't our strength maybe this isn't our best area that we are geniuses in maybe i'm not a health wizard Mm. and maybe i do need some support in this area Mm. And actually just get yourself a damn coach. Like I could not do this on my own. Like I've had to undo so many belief systems, so many stories. And like having someone like Tim in my corner, whether it's Tim, whether you're around the world, I don't know where you guys are, but go and get yourself a coach. I'm sure that if you slide into Tim's DMs, no matter where you are in the world, he'll be able to tell you somebody that you could work with that could give you the support that you need, or he might be able to help you as well. But like, it is okay to prioritize your health. It is okay to count the numbers. It is okay to want to look after yourself. Like this is your journey and it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Like, you know how you feel in your body. Yeah. And I, before we go, I just want to give you one story of the healthy vegan. So a touchy topic, but I had a consultation with a vegan recently and she was telling me how much weight she wanted to lose. And I was like, okay, all well and good. You know, let's run through your diet. Like, what are you having for breakfast, lunch, dinner? You know, what's the caloric um, intake of that? Yada, yada, yada. So it turns out she doesn't want to track her calories and never does. That's fine. But what she failed to realize was that majority of the carbs and fats that she was eating were high in calories, which means her ability to get into a deficit is going to be slim to none. Well, it was very hard for her. And then I, you know, pitched the potential of her to track what she's consuming. And then she said, I'm not going to track what I'm consuming because it's unhealthy to track what you're consuming. So then it was kind of like a catch 22 where she thought it was unhealthy to track and she thought her diet was healthy, but she was getting fatter. So yes, vegan and plant-based diets may be quote unquote healthy, but this wasn't taking her towards her goal of having a good body composition in her terms. So you know, who's losing in that situation. Yeah. It's like, she thinks that it's unhealthy to track, but actually your diet's unhealthy. That's Mm. why you are in the situation. That's why you're here sitting in front of me. Yeah. You know, that's ultimately what it comes down to. So it's like, yeah, whatever diet you're doing right now, (laughs) if you're listening to this, like 
if it's not sending you in the right direction, maybe it's not the healthiest thing for your body. And maybe that's just worth checking in with somebody. Yeah, 100%. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Helix Experience. I love this one. If you guys got something out of it, make sure you leave us a five-star review. Four-star is not going to count um, on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, wherever you're at. And also slide into our DMs, let us know. So I'm at Tim.Frey2Wise and this is Steph Gordon. She has a blue tick verified. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be very easy to find. Um, also, if you're not already following my um, Helix Gym Instagram, which you probably are, make sure you follow that. Thanks, guys.